So tonight we're going to explore chapter 63. Now we are dealing with what we like to call unit 2. Chapters 40 through 66 is distinct from the others. The shift in themes is no less remarkable than the shift in style. Very different, you notice, that you've been with us in this second unit. And uh, we're leaning heavily on the proprietary translation from the Paleo-Hebrew by none other than Dr. Peter Flint himself, the acknowledged expert on the Great Scroll. In fact, that was done for support of the International Standard Bible. And uh, so we lean on this. As we, in fact, we look at that first to get a flavor of the modern flow of, of uh, Isaiah as we go forward. It's interesting that the International Standard Version Bible has relegated both the Masoretic text, the traditional text, and the Septuagint as variant readings. They, they, the first Bible to lean primarily on the Dead Sea Scrolls. That gives them a thousand year advantage over the other manuscripts traditionally used. And so, and our expositional comments will, will, will still remain on the King James. That's our baseline uh, as we go forward. Now, the unit two, as you may recall, has three major segments. <clears throat> the purpose of peace, the prince of peace, and the program of peace. And those first two have a strange verse that sort of ties them off. The, the structure is not something we're imposing on it. It's something that's suggested by the structure itself. And right in the middle of the, the unit 2, we find the, uh, chapter 53 that we uh, devoted several sessions to recently. But tonight we're going to focus on the wrap-up. We'll, we'll take the parsing of the text in the same pattern that the ISV has chosen to parse it. The first six verses are God's day of vengeance. That's going to probably occupy our primary focus this evening. And then verses 7 to 14, God's grace to Israel. And then God the Father, the next few verses. One of the things that may surprise you is there is a prophecy that's the oldest prophecy in the Bible. It's a prophecy by Enoch. Now you won't find it in the book of Enoch. That's another uh, apocryphal collection. But you find it quoted in the book of Jude, verses 14 and 15. And what makes this remarkable, Jude is quoting it, but it's quote, he's quoting Enoch, the seventh from Adam, and this quote that he does is about the second coming of Jesus Christ, and it's ushered before the flood of Noah. Way back to Enoch, which is before Methuselah, before the flood, etc., etc. So in Jude 14 and 15, it may surprise you to take a look at this. And Enoch also, seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, quote, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. It strikes us that they have a vocabulary problem. The word ungodly is used there, what, three or four times. But uh, it's interesting here that uh, uh, this is, this is a, a, a prophecy of the second coming of Christ. And uh, so we'll take a look at this. Now there's another psalm you should be aware of before we get into tonight's material. You need to be sensitive to the second psalm. Of all the psalms, it's perhaps very distinctive because it's a, a conversation among the Trinity. Psalm 2. The first few verses are the voice of the nations themselves. Then we have the voice of the Father in the next couple of verses, the voice of the Son in the next couple of verses, the voice of the Holy Spirit. What you might do as an exercise on your own, when you study Psalm 2, you decide. Take a look at it and see if you can figure out who is speaking to whom. And uh, it's our contention that what, we're getting, what we are privileged here is a glimpse of a trialogue between three people, primarily. The Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. It opens with a question. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed. Saying, and it goes on. We understand here that the kings of the earth and the rulers 
are organizing themselves knowingly, openly, actually, taking up war against God. You know, we can understand people ignoring God. We can see people not believing in God. We can see people insulting God. It's hard for us to visualize leaders knowingly, deliberately, consciously taking up arms against God. You've got to be kidding. Well, it's good. The kings of the earth set themselves and rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, and here's what the people are saying to themselves. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. The rest of the is going to deal with God's reaction to this nonsense. But understand the strange setting here. The people are saying, let us break their bands asunder. Cast away their cords from us. What on earth could they be talking about? Dismissing, disregarding the institutions that God has set up from the beginning. And one of those, just to, not, not the only one, but just to mention one to, so you get the picture here, is the attack against the family, the marriage. This whole business of sanctifying or trying to sanctify what they call same-sex marriage isn't just an issue of homosexuality. It's a way of pulling the rug out from under heterosex marriage to render it irrelevant. It's a move by society against the ordinances of God. That's one of the ways that they're breaking their bands asunder and casting away their cords from us. Obviously what's in view here is much more than just that. But I want you to recognize as we look at the horizon, not just in our own countries, but the, mo most of the countries as you look around the world, are starting to embrace these ungodly gestures to undo what God has established back in the book of Genesis. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens, who's that now? That's God, right? He that sitteth in the heavens is going to do what? He's going to laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Boy, I hope so. Let's see what happens here. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Boy, you and I probably have no ability to imagine what it's like to get God angry. We're so used to a permissive, accommodating, forgiving uh, personality. The idea of him getting angry and having, saying enough already is an idea that isn't something we can really relate to. That goes beyond our imaginations. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And that's what's going to be unfolding here as we get go for more tonight. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. That's the son quoting what the father said about him. And he did that several times. Several times. Not just at his baptism. You can check that out. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. That phrase repeats itself so often throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament, it becomes a primary identity of none other than Yeshua, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. He rules him with a rod of that. That term is uniquely used of him throughout the scriptures, a major identity piece, if you will. And then comes some final advice from all this. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Boy, you know, we just had a weekend study called The Beginning of Wisdom, 
which was our polite way of introducing the concept of fear of God, because the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And we went through the 18 words in the Hebrew that speak of fear, and 17 of the 18 involve trembling. I have to admit that I've gotten a little impatient with these sermons I sometimes hear by pastors who try to argue that what's really in view here is just reverential awe. It certainly is, don't misunderstand me, but I think it's far more than that. I think we're all victims of being overly familiar with the majesty of the Creator and the Redeemer Himself. We need to be, I think, we need to understand our riches in Christ, absolutely. We need to understand His mercy and His grace, absolutely. But not at the expense of being familiar or casual to the one who is ruling the universe. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with what? Trembling. Every time in the scripture, Old and New Testament, when someone's confronted with God, they are flat on their face, terrified. Isaiah was in Isaiah 6, and John was in the book of Revelation, and all between those things, you'll find that repeated. We're going to look at another one tonight before we're through. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, oh boy, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Now kiss, we don't use the word kissing the sun. The term here actually is that is an act of homage, if you will, to a ruler. And it, it, it sounds strange to our ears because we don't use that word in English that way. But that's the translation, and it's a legitimate translation. But the term really implies that which is normally proper in showing homage to the ruler. Kiss the son, lest he be angry. In other words, I'll acknowledge his majesty. Lest he be angry and you perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, you don't mess around. There used to be, I remember years ago, there was a, an advertising theme by saying you don't mess with Mother Nature. And they always had something they, 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 to, to, to sort of characterize. You don't mess around <laughs> with Mother Nature. They used that theme a little bit. But uh, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. And that's the way it wraps up. Okay, so that's Psalm 2. I want to start with this because we're going to be entering here some climactic events that are more climactic than most people are fully appreciative of. So that's the way I thought we'd start. So we're going to jump in, in our study of Isaiah, with Isaiah chapter 63. And it may surprise you to discover there are many people that have written books and things about Armageddon and the end times that haven't bothered to really look carefully at Isaiah 63. Because it includes some things that may surprise you. Let's take a look at the way the ISV deals with this. First of all, it labels it the God's Day of Vengeance. That should catch our attention. Then it raises a question. Who is this coming from Edom? From Basra? In garments stained with crimson? Who is this robed in such splendor, marching in his great might? It is I, speaking in vindication, mighty to save. Let's pause. Who's mighty to save? Who's the only one mighty to save? What term is, who does that refer to in the Bible? Hosanna, huh? The Lord Jesus, indeed. It is I. This is the Lord Jesus apparently here. His, gar his garments are stained red? Why is your clothing red? And your garments like those worn by the ones who tread in the winepress. The allusion here is something that is foreign to most of us, but very common in their culture. And that's when you, you, you step in, you, you crush the, 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 the wine fat. And, and your garments, while you're doing that, get splattered with red from the wine. Why is your clothing red and garments like those worn by those who tread the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone, and from my people no one was with me. I trampled them in my anger and trod them down in my wrath. This is Jesus talking? Wow. Their lifeblood spattered on my garments, and I stained all my clothing. You've got to be kidding. This is strange words. These are very strange words. Continues, for the day of vengeance was in my heart, and the year for my redeeming work had come. 
I looked and there was no helper. I was appalled that there was no one to give support. So my own arm brought me victory, and as for my wrath, it supported me. I trampled people in my anger, and in my wrath I made them drunk, and I poured out their lifeblood on the ground. Wow. How many of us, if we just saw that quote, would have guessed that those are words from the Lord Jesus Christ? Does that give you a little different perspective of something going on here? It gets our attention. Let's take a look at it in the King James. It's not that different. I like to start with the ISV just to give us sort of a fresh uh, glimpse of it all. Who is this that cometh from Edom? Now, uh, with dyed garments from Basra. Now, Basra was the capital of Edom, by the way. And Edom is a pun. It means red, but it's also the region of Esau. You all know that from, the, from your scripture, I'm sure. This that is glorious in his apparel. Now, by the way, apparel usually speaks of righteousness or the lack thereof. We'll get into that later before you. But this is Mashiach Nagid. This is the Jesus, the, 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 the king. And uh, as I say, Edom is a pun. It means red. It also is idiomatic for the traditional enemies of Israel. And I'm going to come back to Edom here in a little bit as we go here. And of course, it's, he's treading grapes, which is why his clothing would be stained red, or that's the parallel that's being drawn here. I that speak in righteousness mighty to save. Wherefore art thou in thine apparel and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fad? He's asking Jesus. He's stained blood, red. What's going on here? And so, the way Basra, by the way, is a term that means sheepfold. It's a place that there, it's protected, and there's a, a narrow gate to to be uh, like a gate for it. That's what the word Basra means. It's like a sheepfold. And uh, in, the, in the Hebrew, it's Basra. The Greek city that you can go see today, if you want to visit it, is called Petra. And uh, it's, by the way, a trip worth taking. Many of your trips to Israel may include that as an option, and I encourage you to take it, because it's quite dramatic to actually visit Petra and understand the situation there. But we'll move on here now. One of the things you should undertake, and I won't try to do the whole story tonight with all the other things that we have to deal with, but you want to make a, a, a serious study of Edom. And very few people really have done the homework to really understand what that term means biblically. And uh, now Moses, you may recall, he was denied passage back in Numbers 20. The Edomites, presumably, since they're Esau, Esau and Jacob were presumably brothers. But Esau deliberately married into the Ishmaelite clan to, to anger the parents. Esau and Jacob are adversaries, way back. When Moses is trying to gain passage, he was denied that in Numbers 20. We know from prophecies in Genesis 25 that Esau is destined to serve Jacob. And I'm sure that bothers him. Edom was a possession for Judah in Numbers 24. David subdued Edom in 2 Samuel 9. There was a subsequent revolt under Jeroboam in 2 Chronicles 21. Um, they smote Judah under Ahaz in 2 Chronicles 28. There's a whole history of tension, obviously. And uh, ready to shed blood and to be cut off and so forth. The whole book of Obadiah, it's a little book, but it's all about the judgments that will come upon Edom. And uh, the attributes of pride to Edom is in Jeremiah 49, Amos 1, and lots of other places. It's interesting to realize the attitudes here when, the, when Nebuchadnezzar's armies surrounded and took captive Judah to, to, into captivity, the Edomites were on the sidelines cheering the enemies on, suggesting to Nebuchadnezzar's soldiers that they take the children and crack their heads on the rocks. The hatred of Edom against Judah is, is proverbial from way back. You need to understand that. In fact, there are um, psalms that are misunderstood where the Jews are saying the same thing to them, what was said to them. So you, it's, it's a reflexive thing that doesn't make sense unless you know the whole history. But I put, uh, we won't take the time here to go through it all, but I have put plenty of uh, references in your notes so you can on your own time, in your own way, with your own resources, make a point of studying Edom. Now, there's a little more you need to understand, and I think I will try to just ad-lib a little of this for you, because I think we have time to do that. 
Edom shows on your Bible maps as being southeast of the Dead Sea. That's out of date in a sense because the Nabataeans drove them west and the Edomites moved to being southwest of the Dead Sea and they formed a country of their own called Idumea. Edomite, Idumea, same thing. Now, as, as history goes on, there was a day, of course, that under the Hasmoneans, that the Jews re, uh, threw off the yoke of the Greek Empire and had a period of rulership called the, the period of the Hasmoneans. When they were in charge, they forced some of the Edomites to become Jews under pressure. And, uh, uh, and, and they either had to become Jews, real Jews, or they had to flee. And uh, so as time goes on and the Romans take over, to the Roman perspective, they regarded Edomites as a kind of Jew. They felt that Esau and Jacob, that's a family squabble. But they regarded Edomites as a almost Jew kind of thing. And when they appointed um, Herods, very serious to, into power, th the Roman mind was, assu they assumed that they were pro-Jewish, not realizing they were actually the traditional enemy within the family of, of Israel. And so um, when, when the, uh, under Hadrian later and so forth, uh, when they get uh, 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 tired of trying to deal with Judea, with all the Jews, they wanted to outlaw the Jews there. Um, uh, they, they, uh, they're, they're, they had two choices. They could name the place Idiomea, but that was still too Jewish. That's why they named it after the Philistines. They're more clear in the, Jew, in the Roman mind, a more clear appellation of their enemies. So that's when they named the place Palestine. And uh, not re uh, so the point I'm getting at is that um, I was very puzzled when I discovered that many rabbis speak of the globalists, pe those, those people that seem to want to create a global world government, the rabbis call them Edomites. And I, where do they get that? And that's because many of them presume, and I'd call it just a presumption at this point, but it has some background, uh, that the people that are in power politically on the planet Earth, many of them are actually Edomites. They may even think they're Jewish. There are people that, uh, like the Rothschilds and others, that you would think are Jewish. They may not be. They may be Edomites. And that's complicated to get into. I highlight that only that it's worth your while to do some homework historically, try to understand what the word Edomites may include, um, for lots of reasons, if for no other reason, that of all the groups in the entire Bible, the ones that are most severely singled out for judgment are not the Arabs, not the Ishmaelites in general, not Egypt, not the Assyrian. There's a bunch of others that are dealt with. None are dealt with more severely, more consistently severely than the Edomites. So it's worth our while to try to understand what that term really means biblically. And it's more than a little study that we can just footnote here. I want to say enough to alert you to do your own homework. And again, so you understand our whole style here in these studies, it's not our intention to sell you a particular point of view. Don't misunderstand me. We will share with you the views we hold and why we hold them as just a way of trying to be helpful. We're anxious for you to get to repair your biblical literacy as much as you can so that you're equipped to navigate <clears throat> your way through the Bible, to access the resources that are available, to come to your own conclusions. And so don't misunderstand our sharing a view that we have with the idea we're necessarily trying to sell that view. We want to let you know what we believe and why we hold it as a help, not, not as a, 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 a point of doctrine. If you study our uh, statement of faith that makes up the Institute's statement, you'll discover it very minimalistic. The, the essentials are just what's really essential. We int intentionally want to give plenty of latitude for you to do your own study, come to your own conclusions on these issues. But having said all that, let's see what the King James continues here with Isaiah 53, starting verse 3. I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. 
For I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in my heart and the year of my redeemed has come. Now there's a phrase that should immediately flag awareness because when we were in Isaiah 61 verse 1 and 2 we encountered the mandate that Jesus declared when he began his ministry at the synagogue in Nazareth. And he quoted that, if you may recall. And uh, there's, by the way, in your notes, there's plenty of other cross-references here. You can cross-reference Revelation 14, 19, and so forth. But uh, remember when we were back in Isaiah 61, we read verses 1 and 2, and we also read the way Jesus read that from Luke chapter 4, you may recall. And Jesus stood up in that uh, synagogue and said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath appointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to pro proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And when he got to that comma, he deliberately stopped, shut the book, and said, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And the thing that catches our attention, it's a hermeneutic issue here, you notice sometimes what's not said or what's missing. So when you compare what he read with what the text actually said, you realize he stopped conspicuously before a phrase. The phrase he paused before was, and the day of vengeance of our God. Now we're encountering the occasion when he specifically is fulfilling that part of it. Up till that comma is what the New Testament records. The Gospels, his, whole, his suffering, his death, his resurrection, all of that is up to that comma. That comma has lasted already about 2,000 years. But it's not going to last much longer because he has a destiny to fulfill the rest of it. And what's missing is this peculiar phrase, the day of vengeance of our God. And he's going to say, this day is this scripture fulfilled in it completing his mandate. That comma is what's lasted about 2,000 years. And I'm not being facetious when I say that Jesus was a dispensationalist. He's highlighting the fact there's a change in dealing here. And of course, the day of vengeance is exactly what is being profiled for us, in part, in Isaiah 63. So we'll go back to 63. And I looked and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. And I will tread down the people in mine anger, and make them drunk in my fury. And I will bring down their strength to the earth. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. None to uphold, none to help. In Luke chapter 18, verse 8, it raises the question, Will the Lord find faith on the earth? Now one of the things that you'll encounter as you study the book of Revelation, up in heaven, the call goes out, who is worthy to open the, there's a seven sealed book presented, the title deed to the earth. Who is worthy to open the book and loose the seals thereof? And no man was found worthy to open the book and loose the seals thereof. It had to be a kinsman of Adam, you see. No man was found. You and I don't know what's going on, but John did, he sobbed convulsively. Because no man was found worthy to open the book. And the elders turned and said, wait, 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 wait. There's one that did. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and loose the seals thereof. And John says he turned and he saw a lion. No. He saw the lamb as it had been slain. He's speaking, of course, metaphorically in, in salvation terms. And then what you see, Jesus is worshipped by the 24 elders, which represent the church. He takes that seven sealed book and starts removing the seals. And from chapter 6 through 19, we have a period of uh, the, a strange time on the planet Earth. It's called the time of the Great Tribulation. And uh, it's a whole study that I encourage you to take a look at. And, uh, but it's puzzling. Why is he in Edom? Why shouldn't he be in Armageddon? It may surprise you there is no battle of Armageddon. Did you know that? 
what we call the, the Armageddon, the Megiddo, is where the troops are being assembled to attack Jerusalem. Megiddo, the plain of Jezreel, what we call Armageddon, is to Jerusalem what England was to the Normandy invasion. The place where you gather the troops and get it all organized for the assault. And he gathered them together in a place which is called in the Hebrew term Har Megiddo, the Mount Megiddo. But that's not the target. The target is Jerusalem, except, except there's a shift of focus. They're supposed to, they think they're going against Jerusalem, except they find they're really being redirected against what? Against Edom. Why? The suggestion is, is that the, the, it has to do with Hosea 5.15, where Jesus says, I will return to my place. That Mr. have he left it. Until they acknowledge their offense. In their affliction, they will seek me earnestly, Hosea 5.15, which tells you the purpose of the Great Tribulation. That's to drive them to the wall. And apparently the remnant, the believing Jews, have fled to Petra as a place of refuge. And so the attack by Satan is to wipe out the believing remnant, because that's a prerequisite to the Second Coming. But Jesus is going there first to protect them, and that's where, that's his first, apparently his first stop. He's not through. There's more coming. Hosea 5.15. What was their offense? It was singular and specific. It was not recognizing their Messiah. And that occurs very formally, of course, in, in um, the triumphal entry. When he rides that donkey. So that's one view is that they fled to Basra. And that's what... Uh, and uh, they recognize their need to call upon his name. And as they do, he comes and rescues them. And the verses are in there. You can check that out. We'll move on here. In Revelation 14, verse 20, it speaks of the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse's bridles. Apparently, what, four feet deep? By the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. What on earth does sixteen hundred furlongs have to do with anything biblical? Can you find that term? or that distance anywhere in the Bible. What's it doing here? What does that mean? Well, let's take a look at this. Here's a map. And Megiddo is where I, he, he, the scripture in Revelation 16, 16, he gathered them together in a place which is called in the Hebrew tongue, Har Megiddo, right? Harmageddon. Okay, and that's Megiddo. But you see what's interesting here they're 1,600 furlongs off. They've retargeted themselves, not against Jerusalem. That was presumably the intent. No, no, they're going after Petra. Why? Because that's where the believing remnant have flown. And what is a prerequisite to the second coming of Jesus Christ is their petition for him to come back. And it wasn't until I discovered that through my own personal walk that I finally solved a mystery. I could never figure out why is Satan so busy? We're all taught that it was all determined at the cross. The cross determined Christ's victory. That's the way we're taught, right? It's done deal. It is finished. To tell us die. Fantastic. Then why is Satan still so busy at it? He believes he can win somehow. And I, when I realize there's no, there's no prerequisite condition for the harpazo, that can happen any time. But there is a prerequisite condition for the second coming of Christ. There's probably several, but one of the main ones is the one that's highlighted for you in Hosea chapter 5, verse, last verse, 15. It says, I return to my place until they acknowledge their offense. In their affliction, they will seek me earnestly. And I suddenly realized, no, a condition for Christ's return is for them to ask Him. And that's exactly what is being, they're being driven to the wall to make that commitment. And that's what Hosea 6 then, the following chapter, deals with. Their call to Him to come and save them. And He does. And what we're seeing unfold, I believe, in Isaiah 63, is the return of Jesus Christ in response to that request saving the remnant. And uh, so that's, that's the perspective that I think we're, we're, we're added here. 
But continuing in Revelation 19, which focuses on all, he says, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Well, heaven was opened at his baptism, but now it's opened in quite a different way. And it's interesting that when you study the four horsemen of the apocalypse, in Revelation 6, the first horseman is on a white horse, and everybody thinks that's, the, the, that's Jesus. No, no, that's a false leader. This is, I, uh, we, uh, we published a, a study called the five horsemen of the apocalypse. Everybody knows about the first four that are listed in Revelation chapter 6. And, uh, but the fifth one is the one not in chapter 6, but in chapter 19, the one we have view here. And I remember I was passing through the workroom and uh, somebody was calling in trying to say, doesn't Chuck know there's just four horsemen of the apocalypse? And uh, Gordon was answering and he says, uh, no, it, well, it, according to us, we try to give you more for your money. And I heard that I, and I had to realize, of course, he was just, he was being playful and, and, he, and, and kidding about it. But uh, no, the, 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 the fifth horseman is a different creature altogether. The first four horsemen are elements of the judgment. And, the, the, and they're the four, and by the way, they're the f four colors that adorn every Muslim flag in the, in the, in the Middle East, by the way. The, the white, the red, the green, the black. If, if you want to do a study on that, it's rather provocative. I wouldn't make too much of that, but it's interesting. But here is not the false horseman that was detailed for us in Revelation 6. Rather, and we, there's a whole study on that. I, it, it's hard to not get all carried away with all these details. But the point is, uh, this is the white horse. And we know who's riding this one. Because he, he that sat upon him is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Who is that, of course? That's our coming king. That's the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. And, um, and he's not coming in the air to take his people home, like in 1 Thessalonians 4. But he's coming to the earth with his people to conquer his enemies and establish his kingdom. And uh, so, so it's, his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And by, and, and, uh, and by the way, these crowns are diadems, not Stefanos. Some of the other crowns are, are um, victory wreaths. No, this is a diadem. These are ruling crowns, different kind of thing. And of course, we know he has many sovereignties. Matthew 28, Luke 19 mention, makes mentions of that. Interesting that he has the emphasis here on the names. He apparently has the names we don't know about. Matthew called him the king of kings. Mark, the faithful uh, servant. And... and uh, John, the Word of God, and, and Luke, the Son of Man. But apparently there's a, a title that we're going to learn about. And his vesture is dipped in blood. Not his blood that was shed on the cross. No, no, this is the blood of his enemies. And uh, we'll move on here. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. So he leaves heaven to come to earth for the last battle. And by the way, he warned them of this when he was under oath before the high priest in Matthew 26. At Pentecost, Peter also referred to this day in Acts chapter 2, verse 19 and 20. And of course, the armies are listed here and in Jude 14 and so forth. Angels are with them, but also we are with them, according to 1 Thessalonians 3 and 2 Thessalonians 1 and a whole bunch of other places. They'll be in your notes. He comes to he from heaven to come on the earth for the last battle. He warned them of his when he was under oath before the high priest. At Pentecost, Peter referred to this day in Acts 2. As far as armies, the angels are with him here, but that's not all. We are too, according to 1 Thessalonians 3, 2 Thessalonians 1, Hebrews 2.10, Colossians 3.4, Zechariah 14.5. Does he need us along? No, he can handle it all himself. That's what the earlier remarks emphasized. But we're in the picture here. Praise God. Wild stuff. Is this really going to happen? Is this just academic? Is this somebody's fanciful conjecture? No. This is real. This is as real as it gets. And it is coming. 
and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Boy, there it is again. Rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Boy, boy, boy. We know the Word is living and powerful. We know that from Hebrews 4.12. We know His Word fulfills His purposes on the earth. We know the enemies are consumed by the spirit of His mouth in 2 Thessalonians 2.8. And so on. When I make a begin, I will also make an end. He warns them in 1 Samuel. This is not the rapture. This is the revelation. It's not in the air. It's on the earth. It's not for the saints. It's with the saints. It's not to comfort, but to conquer. Jesus is not coming to take sides. He's coming to take over. We need to understand that. Okay. He's not to protect us in heaven. He's to rule with us on the earth. You know, it's amazing to me how few churches have any grasp of any of this. How rarely this is taught. The concept of the kingdom. The fact that he's going to come and set up his kingdom on the earth. That he's going to rule the earth from Israel. Those are strange ideas to many churches. Well, you're taking it literally. Absolutely. Absolutely do. Both Old and New Testament emphasize this. We need to, we're going to talk more about that in the next session because we'll talk about His kingdom when we get to chapters 65 and 66. But that's what's coming. That's what this is all about. Revelation 19, 16, He hath on His vesture and on His thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That sounds like a strange place to put it, but if you're, mount, if you're mounted military, having an insignia on your thigh is the natural place to see it. But it sounds strange to us because we're not familiar with that kind of armory, if you will. I always remember when my daughter said, are there going to be animals in heaven? She says, it must be because he comes back riding a horse. And she was, are there animals in heaven? I said, absolutely, we know there's cats in heaven. She says, really, Daddy? She says, yeah, or else, where else would they get the strings for the harps? <laughs> and she almost hit me. She almost hit me. I'll never forget that. <laughs> anyway, I was being mischievous. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. And by the way, don't confuse this grim description with a marriage supper. Many people lump those together and don't realize, no, those are two very different things. This is pretty grim here. Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Wow! No, there's two suppers. Don't get them confused. So sort those out for yourself. Flesh is, occurs six times in this paragraph, and it goes on and on about that. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse, and against his army. You know, that, that's the part of this whole thing that baffles me. I find it hard to imagine the kings of the earth and their leaders, whatever, knowingly trying to make war against God. Somehow, that, that is, uh, that I, I, I lack the imagination, the perspective to embrace that. It's just too bizarre for me. They gather together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. You've got to be kidding. Well, Psalm 2 told us, you know, this battle is the laughter of God against man's arrogance. This coming world leader is going to be headquartered in Palestine. We know from Daniel 11, verse 45. We know the coming world leader is going to go forth in great fury in Daniel 11. A great motorized army, according to Nahum, arrayed in red, apparently. And on it goes. I might mention, by the way, trying to sort all these pieces in order, there's good scholars that have slightly different views, and that's fine. I'll be very candid with you. I lean very heavily on Arnold Fruchtenbaum's perspective, being very Jewish and very his, his uh, profile, it's called the uh, Footsteps of the Messiah, 
he includes in his perspective a, a many, many of the passages that many scholars sort of miss because they don't understand them. Uh, he, he has the most comprehensive perspective in my view, and it all, as he lays it out, it all seems to fit together. But it's important that you don't just buy this or buy mine or whatever, that's not the point. What you do want to do is as you study, make sure that the perspectives that you begin to embrace fit all together. What makes eschatology so challenging is that it needs, they all need to fit together. And, uh, and they will. And uh, if there's places they don't quite fit together, no problem, keep studying. But uh, it's, uh, the beast was taken, and, and with him the false prophet. Remember in Revelation 13, there's two guys, there's not one antichrist, there's two people. One we call the beast, and the other beast they call the false prophet. One apparently is the political leader, and the other one is the one that causes everyone to worship the political leader. But it's a duet. The beast was taken, and with him the false prophet, that wrought miracles before him. See, the false prophet is going to do miracles to get everybody to buy into the leadership of, this, of, of we, the one we call the beast here. With which he deceived them that received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. That's Gehenna. That's not Hades. Hades is temporary. That one is permanent. What's very strange, we see them cast here in Revelation 19, the two guys, the two players. Satan isn't dealt with yet. Satan is going to be bound for a thousand years and then turned loose. These two guys will be cast into the lake, into Gehenna. We're going to discover a thousand years later, these two guys are still there burning. See, they're outside time. We have no grasp of what it is like to be outside the time dimension without hope. There's no way we can embrace, we, we, we can't imagine that. But these two guys are cast alive into Gehenna. While these two are cast alive into Gehenna, two others, Moses and Elijah, I believe, will be taken alive into heaven in chapter 11 of Revelation. But I'll let you synchronize that in, through your own studies. Okay. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. There's no resurrection here, by the way. The, re the resurrection has already occurred. The second resurrection will occur a thousand years later. See, unbelievers, when they die, will go to Hades, the unseen world, a temporary realm for the dead. Believers will immediately go uh, to, to, uh, in the presence of the Lord, according to Philippians 1.19 and 2 Corinthians 5 and other passages. Hades will ultimately be emptied of its dead in Revelation 20, in the next chapter of Revelation, Revelation 20.13. But Jesus now takes the, takes the throne upon the earth, and it's the throne of David. That was predicted in Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7, you may recall. It's also emphasized in the promise that the, Gabriel gave Mary when he announced the birth of Christ, that he will have the throne of David. It's astonishing to me to notice how few churches even talk about Jesus taking the throne of David. And we're not talking about the temple of Ezekiel, which is a priestly temple. We're talking about a tabernacle of David, which is a king's palace. Wow. It's a throne. Well, many of us also are familiar with Zechariah, which has much to say. He says, I will gather the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city will go, into, go forth into captivity and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Now you, when you see that in Zechariah 14 verse 3, that's a good question. When did the Lord fight in the day of battle? Anyone, anyone remember Jesus fighting a battle in the Bible anywhere? Jericho. What? Jericho. There you go. Colin, you're absolutely right, my friend. Jericho. And we'll take a look at that here in a minute here. And, uh, uh, but let's just finish this phase and I'll come back to that. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. 
and there shall be a very great valley, and half the mountain shall be moved towards the north, half of it to the south. And uh, so, there, by the way, uh, when we first, when we went back in the 70s when I took my family for the, our first trip to Israel, we happened uh, to stay at the Intercontinental Hotel, which is now known as the Seven Arches up there on the, on the hill. And, uh, but we also found out that there's a geodetic fault and uh, there, that apparently is set up so that it will split. That mountain will be split, apparently. And so that's kind of colorful. But getting back to this issue, when, when you look at Joshua chapter 5, the book of Joshua, it says, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked. This is all before the battle of Jericho, by the way. This is in chapter 5. The battle of Jericho occurs in chapter 6. It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. So picture, Jer picture Josh. He's standing sentry duty, and here's a stranger with his sword drawn. And Joshua went unto him and said, Are thou for us or for our adversaries? He's challenging the stranger like a sentry would, right? <laughs> Notice what happened. And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And what does Joshua do? He fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? Joshua realized that this is, 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 is not an angel. It's something far more than that. And in the next verse, the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Why did he do that? Because he could recall the previous time when he was told to remove his shoes on Jabal al-Laws when he's there with Moses. He was in Exodus 24, verses 13 to 15. The question you want to ask your local Bible study is, who fought the battle of Jericho? The song says Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, and that ain't right. Here's the guy that really fought the battle of Jericho, and he violated every law in the Torah to do so. They're supposed to, to work six days and keep the seventh three, right? The seventh time they go seven times around the place. They kept silence until the seventh time of the seventh day, and then they shouted and the walls came down. That's exactly a an enactment in advance of what goes on in the book of Revelation, chapter 8, verse 1, where there's silence in heaven for half an hour, and then you have the sevens and so on. No, the, the Ark of the Covenant wasn't go to war. It led the, war, uh, it led the parade in, at Jericho. And the more you study the Torah, and the more you study the Battle of Jericho, you'll discover that almost every rule that is operative in the Torah is ignored in the Battle of Jericho. Who's running things? The Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. He fought the battle. It's my suggestion. Okay. Well, let's continue to wrap this up here. Let's continue uh, the ISV. We just took the, took the front end of 63. Let's go on here. I will recount the gracious deeds of the Lord, the praiseworthy acts of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has done for us. See, this is now focusing on Israel. Let's remember that I, remember Isaiah was the royal prophet to the king. That was his job. So he's He's, he's, he's amending all this with the implications for Israel. Yes, the great goodness of the house of Israel that he has granted them according to his mercy, according to the abundance of his gracious love. For he said, surely they are my people, children who won't act falsely. And so he became their savior. In all their distress, he wasn't distressed, but the angel of his presence saved them. In his acts of love and in his acts of pity, he redeemed them. He carried them and lifted, up, lifted them up in the days of old. Yet they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit, so he changed them and became their enemy, and he, he, he himself fought against them. Then they remembered the days of old of, of Moses, his servant. Where's the one who brought up out of the sea the shepherds of his flock? Where's the one who put his Holy Spirit among them and who made his glorious arm march at Moses' right hand, who divided the waters in front of them to win an everlasting name, who led them through the depths like a horse in the open desert, they did not stumble. Like cattle that came down to the valley, the Spirit of the Lord gave them rest. For you led your people to win for yourself a glorious name. 
Well, skimming through the King James parallels all this. I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord hath bestowed on us. The great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he hath bestowed on them according to his mercies and according to the multitude of his loving kindnesses. For he said, surely they are my people, children that will not lie, so he was their savior. Them designating my people is important to see the underscore, especially if you understand Hosea, the first couple of chapters, because there was a time when God had set them aside, not here. And this is a reinstatement, so to speak. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and his pity, in his pity, he redeemed them. He bare them. He carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy. And he fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people, saying, Where is he that brought them out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him? that led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make himself an everlasting name. That led them through the deep as a horse in the wilderness, that they should not stumble as a beast goeth down into the valley. The Spirit of the Lord caused him to rest. So didst thou lead thy people to make thyself a glorious name. And so it continues here, and the last stanza here. Uh, starting verse 15 in the ISV, Look down from heaven and see from your holy and glorious dwelling. Where are your zeal and your might? Where are the yearning of your heart and your compassion? They're all held back from me. But you are our father, even Abraham does not know us, and Israel has not acknowledged us. You are he, O Lord, our father, from long ago. Our Redeemer is your name. Why, Lord, do you make us wander from your ways and harden our hearts so that we do not fear you? Turn back for the sake of your servants, for the sake of the tribes that are your heritage. Your holy people took possession for a little while, but now our enemies have trampled down your sanctuary for a long time. We have been, we have been those you do not rule, those who are not called by your name. Wow. So how does it read in the King James? Look down from heaven look, and behold the habitation of, of thy holiness and thy glory. Where is thy zeal and thy strength and the sounding of thy bowels and thy mercies toward me? Are they restrained? Doubtless thou art our father, though Abraham be ignorant of us, the Israel acknowledges us. Thou, O Lord, art our father, our redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. Boy, verse 16 is a strange one. I'll let you sort that through. What is it talking about? Doubtless thou art our father, though Abraham be ignorant of us. And Israel acknowledges not. Thou, O Lord, art our Father, our Redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. I'll let you chew on that one as we go forward here. O Lord, why hast thou made us to err from thy ways and hardened our heart from thy fear? Return for thy servant's sake, the tribes of thine inheritance. The people of thy holiness have possessed but a little while. Our adversaries have trodden down thy sanctuary. We are thine. Thou never bearest rule over them. They were not called by thy name. Our adversaries were trodden down by thy sanctuary. You can see that as the Babylonians in the one case, or the Romans in 70 AD. But thy name was not called upon them. Okay. And so with that, let's bow our hearts for a closing prayer.